healing of a demon-possessed man. Mark 5 verses 1 to 20. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he often had been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Good morning, everybody. The first thing that you will notice is that I sound quite nasal this morning. Don't worry, however, I have a cortisone spray which is sorting my out, me out. You don't have to fear, it's not COVID, it's just a bit of hay fever, but I am doctoring myself and will be A for away quite soon. It is a joy for me to be with you and I pray for this to be a blessed time for you as you watch and listen to what I have prepared. Today we kick off a new series called From the Old to the New. And over the next few weeks, we will be unpacking the lives of those who drastically needed Jesus, who then met him, and because of their encounter with him, were left to never be the same again. We start with a very interesting passage, the case of the demon-possessed man. His story is recorded in Mark 5. It is quite a detailed story, and you will have had the reading just before the sermon. Mark 5, verses 1 to 20. It is very clear that by verse 20, this man had received new life, a new beginning, new hope, new purpose, new direction. All because Jesus had arrived, touched his life, and showed him that he, Jesus, was indeed in the changing business. The series that we are embarking on today is all about new life. It is about those words of St. Paul in his second letter to the Corinthians, becoming a reality for all of us. For that is where Paul writes the following words, saying that if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. 
as we look at different gospel figures over the next few Sundays. I trust that each story will bring us to a place of transformation, a place where a new season dawns for us, a place where our relationship with Jesus can have an injection of renewal and excitement. Let's zoom in on the character for today, this demon-possessed man who no one wanted to touch with a ten-foot pole. He was ostracized by the community. Everybody was scared of him. They were scared of him because they needed to be. He was a threat to society, a madman if there ever had been one. Scripture teaches us that he was truly, truly desperate. The first sign of his desperation is given by the fact that he lived amongst tombs. No person in their right mind would ever do that. The problem with living amongst tombs, of course, was that he would have been considered very unclean by the religious sector of the day. There was a law which stated that if one ever touched a corpse, that one would be very much unclean, too unclean to appear at the temple anyway. Often tombs were whitewashed in order to stand out so that any passers-by wouldn't make any kind of mistake of not only touching a body, a corpse, but even a tombstone. That was, of course, to create a definite certainty that no uncleanliness was to be questioned. This person, this demon-possessed man, lived amongst tombs. That speaks volumes of just exactly how deranged he was. It is also recorded there that he had been chained up before. The authorities saw him as dangerous and tried their very best to not let him do any harm or damage to people or property. These chains unfortunately did not work. He would break them quite easily and loose himself to continue a life of free and utter lunacy. Not only was he very strong, he also did weird eccentric things. Scripture teaches us that he would cut himself with sharp stones. I'm sure, friends, that you can imagine what a sorry sight it must have been spotting this man, running up and down like a wild thing in some primitive cemetery, shouting at the top of his voice, cutting himself with sharp stones, too strong for anybody to contain him. His fate was a hopeless one. He was hopeless and helpless for as long as people could remember. Until that fateful day when Jesus rocked up on the scene. Where Jesus offered him healing and restoration. This man was never the same again. I wonder where your mind has gone as I have explained this person's desperation. As I have explained in detail exactly how desperate he was. Perhaps you and I have often been in that kind of place ourselves. I'm not saying that we have been wild and out of control. I'm not saying that we have ever attempted to live in a cemetery. And I don't think we have ever gone to the extreme measure of cutting ourselves with sharp stones. But perhaps we know exactly the kind of desperation that this man knew. Perhaps our lives have also taken wrong turns 
Perhaps we have also been foolish with the decisions we have made. Or perhaps it is fate that has caused us great pain and suffering. Perhaps we have also sat in dark holes wanting to give up. Perhaps even considering bringing an end to it all. Have you ever been desperate? Have you ever felt completely and utterly hopeless? Have you ever thought that it could be true that you have finally reached a place where no one and nothing can help you? That you have fallen too far? That your wounds are too deep? That your road is too long? That your nights are too lonely? Have you ever reached that place of desperation to the extent where nothing and no one matters? If that is the case for you, you need to find great comfort in today's story. For the point is abundantly clear that no one, no one is too desperate for Jesus to save. No one has ever fallen too far. No one is ever too unclean for him to rescue, to cleanse and to purify. No one is ever too helpless for him to find, to help and bring home to himself. Today's demon-possessed man is case in point. And I trust that even as I say these words, that hope springs up like a river in your heart, telling you that you are not forgotten, that you have not been written off, that there's a chance for you still. The second thing I think we need to highlight from the passage is that the demons in this man, the demons who called themselves, uh, themselves legion because they were many, came face to face with Jesus, the Son of God. And I'm so fascinated by the fact that these demons recognized who Jesus was. For when they called out to him, they wanted to know what he wanted to do with them as the Son of the Most High God. And what I want to explain under this point is this, that whatever demons we are fighting need to be exposed to the ministry of Jesus. Do you hear me? Whatever demons are haunting us and causing us immense struggle need to be exposed to the touch of to the ministry, to the healing power of Jesus, the Son of God. You can't see it on camera, but I'm tingling all over as I say it. Probably because I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that they, if there is someone who can redeem us from our demons, from the things that cause us great hurt, from the things that cause us great worry, from the things that cause us great fear, it is Jesus. Jesus the Christ. It was when these demons came face to face with Jesus, when they were exposed for exactly who and what they were. This event happened long ago, 2,000 years ago, in fact, and we weren't there that day when this drama unfolded. So we can just imagine what it looked like as these demons came out of this man, went into the pigs who then ran into the sea. It won't bring us very far if we get technical about what happened on that day so long ago. Perhaps it would be wiser for us to study our own lives, 
to ascertain exactly what the things are that lurk in our lives like ghosts to bring them to Jesus so that he can heal us as we get rid of them for good. What is currently the demon in your life? What is that which causes you to not be free? What is that which causes you to go mad with concern, with fear? What is that which makes you feel panic-stricken and nerve-wracked? <coughs> what is that which is causing you paranoia? What is that which is keeping you from the kingdom of God? What is that which is keeping you from the peace that Jesus wants to give you? Perhaps I can throw around a couple of concepts and maybe I will touch a spot as I do so. What is the demon that you need to expose to the love and to the grace of Jesus? Is it pride? Is pride that which is getting you down, pulling you down in a vortex of despair and hopelessness? Is it arrogance? Is it lust? Is it greed? Are you battling with the spirit of judgment or envy or unforgiveness? What is that which steals your sleep at night? That when others are all safely in the land of Nod, you are tossing and turning, almost as if you were being chased by a ghost, not wanting to leave you alone. What are the demons in your life? What are the demons in mine? Here's a thought, instead of hiding them, instead of keeping them for ourselves, instead of trying to bury them like a secret of old, how about bringing them to Jesus? How about offering them to our dear Savior? How about bringing them to the light, exposing them so that we can get somewhere here, so that they can be put to flight forever, so that they can be chased away by what Jesus is able to do, by his healing power and his saving mercy. The more we try to hide things the more troublesome our lives will become. I'm reminding you of a way out today, my brother, my sister. Here's your chance. Bring whatever is ruining your life to Jesus so that you can be free. Free forever. It was when these demons confronted Jesus that they were chased out of him, out of the demon-possessed man, and went into the pigs. Jesus hasn't lost his ability to renew, to restore, to redeem, and to make whole. This man's story can be your story today. The last thing I think we have to make mention of is that this man turned into a missionary overnight. He wanted to go with Jesus. It is written there at the end of the passage that he wanted to get into the boat with Jesus and it looks like he wanted to spend the rest of his life with Jesus for he was so amazed about what Jesus had done for him. 
But Jesus did not allow him to go with him. Jesus instead did a funny thing. Jesus said to him, go and tell others, especially your family, start at home in other words, go and tell others what has happened in your life. And then out of pure joy, this is exactly what madman does. He goes and becomes the first missionary when one looks at the gospel of Mark. The first missionary announcing the good news of the arrival of Messiah. He couldn't keep the message to himself, sharing with all and sundry about what Jesus was able to do. He wanted others to know that what Jesus had done for him, Jesus would be able to do for them. I'm quite intrigued by the fact that Jesus makes such a big fuss of how he needed to go home and tell his family first and foremost. Perhaps there's a lesson there for us, for I've always found ministering to family the most challenging. Perhaps there is where our light needs to shine the brightest. From my childhood, there's a Sunday school chorus that I remember fondly. It was sim sung by Jim Reeves originally. The words go as follows. It is no secret what God can do. What is done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. If there's ever something that I want you to remember at the end of a sermon, it would be that. It is no secret what God can do. Here I'm tingling again. What is done for others, he can do for you. Let me recap my three points before I shut up. Firstly, this man was very, very desperate. But then that tells us that no one is ever too desperate for Jesus to reach out to. Secondly, it was when his demons confronted Jesus that he was healed and freed. And thirdly, he became a very, very effective missionary, telling all who came his way about Jesus and what he had done for him. Once Jesus has changed our lives, once Jesus has restored us, perhaps we can do the same, sharing with all we meet, telling them about his unconditional love, telling them about his tender grace, telling them about his forgiveness, his hope, and above all, his peace. May the words of St. Paul become a reality for you over the next few weeks. And even as you continue to think about this madman, this demon-possessed guy in Mark chapter 4, may you know beyond a shadow of any doubt that yes, when someone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. It was true for this weird, eccentric, crazy person in Mark chapter 5. It can be true for you. Amen.